Hi. Uh, hey, hey. <laughs> um, I'm really so honored to be here because um, actually my inspiration for this entire project was my Swedish grandfather who was um, an engineer who was knighted by the Swedish king actually and moved to the United States and, and was a very passionate environmentalist who um, kind of started realizing towards the end of his life that a lot of the work that he'd been doing to, to automate things and build silos and kind of create a lot of uh, things involved in our food system and in major scale engineering in our country was starting to actually erode the quality of life that people had. Um, and it was a conversation that he had with me very late in his life that actually was the impetus for this project. So it's really, really such an honor to be back here in his country knowing that um, I've been able to have an impact here and that actually window farming has become very popular in Sweden because of the desire to um, you know, grow food during the winter. You guys really um, get that. So. Um, and Yancey couldn't be here, um, but he's a, a friend of mine, one of the co-founders of Kickstarter, and I've spoken with him before, so I kind of know why he invited me. Um, and that's because, specifically, this project is not a film or a book or, um, you know, an album, which are kind of a lot of the, the more traditional product or projects that get put onto crowdfund crowdfunding sites. And so Yancey and Perry like to ask me to talk because they see this as an example of one of the kinds of projects that they think um, represent kind of a new, um, a new era of projects that are really um, possible because of crowdfunding. So first I'll just tell you a little bit about the Window Farms project, but I'm not gonna focus on that because I wanna again be able to talk more about crowdfunding and, and good strategies for that, so. Um, some of you all may have heard about uh, the urban agriculture movement and um, especially vertical farming. So the idea of putting a farm into a skyscraper and putting that in the middle of the city um, to help out with the, um, the problem of really supplying fresh food, um, those things that die very quickly in transit um, and lose a lot of their nutritional value. Um, by doing that inside of a city, you can actually, using very high-tech agriculture, um, you can provide some of that fresh nutrition to the city um, locally. And uh, this is a, um, this is a set of technologies that are actually very viable um, and which uh, are also very popular because who doesn't love a room full of plants, especially really fresh ones? So I think that that's part of the cause of this idea just kind of spreading everywhere. Um, but there's actually still a lot of um, engineering work to be worked out and there's also a lot of experimentation with agriculture um, at this level especially doing it in an environmentally responsible way and in a way that involves good nutrition um, that sort of it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem of having to have the billions of dollars that it will take to build one of these things and then also not knowing whether or not whether we're, we're going to build it right so um, Three years ago, I got excited about the idea of why should just the scientists be able to be in this awesome, big, crazy building full of plants? What if all of us could actually have um, a small version of that experience right there in our own home so that we're getting to benefit from some of that quality of life um, and we're also getting to learn a lot more about where our own food comes from and actually become agriculturalists again, um, which is you know, such a fundamentally human um, pursuit. So, um, what if we actually rethought what a window is um, and thought about actually our relationship with the environment and bringing some of that very in-depth relationship with um, essentially transforming our relationship with, um, with cities and with their role with ecology, what if we actually were able to tinker with that on a much more personal scale? So 
I had been working in the open source software movement and my idea was what if I take open source software and that kind of structure of collaboration and I apply it to these physical systems. And so again, bring it to the personal scale, focus on making some of these technologies organic because hydroponics and a lot of these technologies tend not to be organic, there are some issues involved there and to really make that open source collaboration work for something physical. And so now, th three years later, we actually have very viable working prototypes all over the world that are being tested and implemented by hundreds and hundreds of people um, using a all slightly different methods. Um, and they're all reporting back to our central website where we have a social media site. Um, so a window farm is, uh, it allows you to grow um, a pretty wide variety, actually, of vegetables, anything but root vegetables or um, things that are really tall, like corn and wheat. Um, and uh, th it's really a mass collaboration project. So there are people all over the world, like, um, like David mentioned. Um, and basically, it's, the way that it works is that there's a reservoir of some kind down at the bottom which holds a liquid nutrient solution. So it's water with... Um, uh, the particular kinds we use have molasses, ground up seaweed, um, and seabird guano essentially dissolved into this water. And it, um, there's a pump that's on a timer that sends some of this liquid nutrient up to the top. The plant's roots are sitting in clay pellets. It trickles through um, and essentially bottle feeds the plant. So they grow differently than they do in soil, actually. And so you're able to fit a lot more plants into a very small area. Um, and so we're an open source project. So we actually have available online very detailed instructions on how to make these systems um, using any variety of containers, but the easiest thing to use is to reappropriate water bottles. Um, and so we, have, we now have over 20,000 people around the world who have downloaded the instructions and have been building their own systems. Um, and then we started supporting ourselves by actually making kits um, that we sold in the United States, which were everything but the water bottles, and now we're actually starting to produce products, so um, a much more polished, um, finished uh, system that's designed by really great industrial designers, um, and that also supports um, the mass collaboration project. Once you get a window farm up and running, you've got to do a couple things to tweak it um, and to uh, understand how it's going to work in your own particular windows, in your own conditions. Um, and it really is a farming project. You are having to make the same sort of decisions as a farmer does about what you're going to plant where and what portion of your real estate is going to be used up for what kind of plant. And um, you don't have to have a green thumb because you learn how to do this from other window farmers. Um, and we share, um, we basically share information as we try out different heirloom species and understand this particular species grows well under these conditions um, versus someone else. Uh, so we have all of these people all over the world who have been collaborating and sharing knowledge um, about how to do this. Um, and at one point, it just really um, hit me that I was running out of money to, to fund this project, and I needed to figure out how to make it fund itself. And this, at this point, we had about 4,000 users. Um, and so, uh, you know, I I'd tried all variety of things. I tried getting funding from more foundation type organizations as as an NGO in the United States. And really, because we were so unusual, we were having a hard time getting any kind of funding. So um, that was when uh, I took my first crowdsourcing project um, and did uh, Kickstarter. And this particular, this was very, pretty early on in Kickstarter's career. Um, and uh, basically, the focus of the Kickstarter campaign was to really appeal to people's hearts. So um, to have them have the experience when they're supporting the project of um, really contributing to something and having a role that they were playing in this, this project making it. Um, and the particular project was to fund us to be able to sell kits to support ourselves. Um, and 
using the funding that we got from that, we were actually able to launch a kit sales business, which we've now made $130,000 from, which does not quite cover all of the costs of the project in total, but has generated a relatively good amount of revenue. Um, at the time, uh, so uh, this was a little bit before Simon's project, about nine months before that. Um, and there were a couple of strategies that I used. First of all, because I was appealing to the heart, I had it coincide with the time that many people are committing their philanthropic dollars for the year. So it was right before, um, right between Christmas and, and New Year's that the um, campaign closed. Um, so that was really good timing for people who are writing their checks at the end of the year. So it was more thinking strategically about when are people going to have money available. Um, the second thing is that I knew that we had to win. We needed to, nobody wants to jump on a sinking, a sinking ship. People always want to join something that they can tell is winning. So in my back pocket, I had a funder who I knew was really committed to the project. And instead of having her write the check earlier, I said I went to her and I said, "How about we leverage this money that you're gonna that I know that you're gonna be willing to commit to the project and have it be, um, you know, something that makes the project win so that other people will commit." Um, and that actually worked. So about a, a week into the project. I had her write that check, and all of a sudden we had $7,000 um, towards our $20,000 goal, and people were like, wow, what happened? And then all of a sudden we were starting to get a lot more um, commitments and donations. Um, but so that was in 2009, the end of 2009, the beginning of 2010. And our community is actually a very long-term community. If you build a window farm and you're growing things in it, you are a really dedicated person in this community. So we actually have to fund ourselves for a very, very long time. And my theory is that you actually cannot do a crowdfunding project from the heartstrings twice. You can only do it once because you're going back and appealing to that same community again, and you just, it takes a lot of kind of PR oomph to get that, those people's attention, and you're just, I think it's gonna be a really tricky thing to do that twice. So our next set of crowdfunding projects that we're doing to um, forward the organization are gonna be appealing to people's purses. Um, so we've learned a lot about our business, essentially, um, over the course of selling kits, and now we're going to follow a model for selling our new fancy window farms um, that's much more like the model that the TikTok and, uh, group used, where they were basically, they've, they raised close to a million dollars on Kickstarter, um, selling basically just these plastic bands that let you stick an iPod Nano in to basically make it a watch. And they were doing pre-sales of this product. And if you look at their video compared to other people's videos, what you'll notice is that basically their videos are just completely sales. So the entire proposition is you are getting a great deal. So they don't talk very much at all about their own personal story, their own personal passion or motivation, except for to the extent that they're proving that they're gonna be able to execute on it. So I think that that's, that's one thing that we're just seeing happen um, between crowds um, in crowdfunding projects is that there are some that are really kind of focused on this, you are getting a good deal versus you are doing a good deed. And I think that there's a lot of blending of the two, which is really, really important on these funding sites. But if you're going to do a crowdfunding project, you really want to kind of come from which one of those is my leading strategy and use the other um, and use the rest of the story to kind of build around that but fundamentally make that, that choice. Um, and that's it. And this is my email. If anybody, I'm happy to help you with your Kickstarter strategy or your other crowdfunding strategy, so please send me an email. <laughs>